ಸ್ನೇಹಿತರೆ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಬೆಂಗಳೂರು ಹಿಸ್ಟೋರಿಯನ್ ಸೊಸೈಟಿ ಇತಿಹಾಸ ದರ್ಪಣ ಹಾಗೂ ಋತುಮಾನ ಡಾಟ್ ಕಾಂ ಸಂಯುಕ್ತ ಆಶ್ರಯದಲ್ಲಿ ನಡೀತಾ ಇರತಕ್ಕಂತಹ ಅರಿವಿನ ನೀರಿಗೆ ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಆನ್ಲೈನ್ ಉಪನ್ಯಾಸ ಸರಣಿಯ ಹದಿನೈದನೇ ಉಪನ್ಯಾಸಕ್ಕೆ ತಮ್ಗೆಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ಕೂಡ ಹೃದಯಾಂತರಳದಿಂದ ಸ್ವಾಗತವನ್ನು ಕೋರ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೇನೆ ಇವತ್ತು ನಮ್ಮನ್ನ ಕುರಿತು ಮಾತನಾಡ್ಲಿಕ್ಕಿರೋರು ರಾಯ್ ಯಶ್ ಫಿಶಲ್ ಅವರು ರಾಯ್ ಎಸ್ ಫಿಶಲ್ ಅವರು ಲಂಡನ್ ನ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಆಫ್ ಲಂಡನ್ ನ ಸಾಸ್ ಸೆಂಟರ್ ನಲ್ಲಿ ಹಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿಯ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಆಗಿ ಕಾರ್ಯನಿರ್ವಹಿಸ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದಾರೆ ತಮ್ಮ ಪಿ ಎಚ್ ಡಿ ಪದವಿಯನ್ನ ಎರಡ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಹನ್ನೆರಡರಲ್ಲಿ ಅವರು ಬಹಮನಿಯ ಕುರಿತಾಗಿಯೇ ಮಾಡ್ತಾರೆ ಅವರ ಮುಖ್ಯವಾದ ಅಧ್ಯಯನ ವಿಷಯಗಳು ದಕ್ಷಿಣ ಭಾರತದ ಮಿಡಿವಲ್ ಸಂದರ್ಭದ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ ಸೊಸೈಟಿ ಐಡಿಯಾಲಜಿ ಐಡೆಂಟಿಟಿ ಮತ್ತು ಆಧುನಿಕ ದಕ್ಷಿಣ ಏಷ್ಯಾ ಹಾಗೂ ಮುಸ್ಲಿಂ ಜಗತ್ತುಗಳ ನಡುವಿನ ಸಮನ್ವಯದ ಸಂಗತಿಗಳ ಅಧ್ಯಯನ ಅವರ ಮೊತ್ತ ಮೊದಲ ಮಹಾಪ್ರಬಂಧ ಅಥವಾ ಮೊನೋಗ್ರಾಫ್ ಅಂತೇಳಿ ಕರಿಬಹುದು ಅದು ಲೋಕಲ್ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಆನ್ ಇಂಪೀರಿಯಲ್ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಐಡೆಂಟಿಟಿ ಸೊಸೈಟಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಪಾಲಿಟಿಕ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಅರ್ಲಿ ಮಾಡರ್ನ್ ಡೆಕ್ಕನ್ ಅನ್ನೋದು ಈ ಕೃತಿ ಲಭ್ಯ ಇದೆ ಅವರು ಅವರ ಇನ್ನೊಂದು ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಆದ ಕೃತಿ ಈಗ ಅಚ್ಚಿನಲ್ಲಿದೆ ಅವರ ಲೋಕಲ್ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಆನ್ ಇಂಪೀರಿಯಲ್ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಕೃತಿ ಎಡಿನ್ಬರ್ಗ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿಯಿಂದ ಪ್ರಕಾಶಿತಗೊಂಡಿದೆ ಮತ್ತು ರಾಯಲ್ ಏಷ್ಯಾಟಿಕ್ ಸೊಸೈಟಿ ಕೂಡ ಇದಕ್ಕೆ ಸಹಯೋಗವನ್ನು ಮಾಡಿದೆ ಅವರ ಸದ್ಯದ ಅಥವಾ ವರ್ತಮಾನದ ಕೃತಿ ಮತ್ತು ಅಧ್ಯಯನಗಳು ಬಹಮನಿ ಮತ್ತು ದಕ್ಷಿಣ ಭಾರತದ ಸಮಾಜವು ರಾಜಕೀಯ ಚಾರಿತ್ರಿಕ ಸಂಗತಿಗಳನ್ನ ಅತ್ಯಂತ ಮುಖ್ಯವಾಗಿ ಗಮನಿಸುತ್ತೆ ಮತ್ತು ಅಧ್ಯಯನಕ್ಕೆ ಇಳಿಸಿದೆ ಮುಖ್ಯವಾಗಿ ಕಿಂಗ್ಶಿಪ್ ಸಾವರ್ನಿಟಿ ಸಾರ್ವಭೌಮಾಧಿಕಾರ ರಾಜತ್ವ ಮತ್ತು ಬಿಜಾಪುರದ ಚರಿತ್ರಶಾಸ್ತ್ರ ಇವತ್ತಿನ ಮಂಡನೆ ಕೂಡ ಬಿಜಾಪುರದ ಚರಿತ್ರಶಾಸ್ತ್ರದ ಕುರಿತೆ ಆಗಿದೆ ವಿಶೇಷವಾಗಿ ಬಿಜಾಪುರ ಅಂತಕ್ಕಂತಹ ಒಂದು ಅಹ್ ಒಂದು ಒಂದು ಐಡಿಯಾ ಹೇಗೆ ಪರ್ಷಿಯಾದ ಜಗತ್ತಿನ ಜೊತೆಗೆ ಇಸ್ಲಾಮಿಕ್ ಜಗತ್ತಿನ ಜೊತೆಗೆ ಅಥವಾ ಅರೇಬಿಯಾದ ಜಗತ್ತಿನ ಜೊತೆಗೆ ಅಥವಾ ಬಿಜಾಪುರೇತರ ಜಗತ್ತುಗಳ ಜೊತೆಗೆ ಸಾಂಸ್ಕೃತಿಕವಾಗಿ ಮತ್ತು ಸಾಹಿತ್ಯಿಕವಾಗಿ ಯಾವ ರೀತಿಯ ಸಂವಾದವನ್ನ ನಡೆಸ್ತು ಅನ್ನೋದು ಅವರ ಅಧ್ಯಯನದ ಮತ್ತು ಆಸಕ್ತಿಯ ಕ್ಷೇತ್ರಗಳು ಬಹುಶಃ ಇವತ್ತಿನ ವಿಷಯ ಲೋಕಲ್ ಕಲ್ಚರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸ್ ರೀಜನಲ್ ಕಲೆಕ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಸುಲ್ತಾನೇಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಬಿಜಾಪುರ್ ಅಥವಾ ಅಹ್ ಅಂತಕ್ಕಂಥ ಈ ವಿಷಯದಲ್ಲಿ ರಾಯ್ ಅವರು ಸರಿಸುಮಾರು ತೊಂಬತ್ತು ನಿಮಿಷಗಳ ಕಾಲ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ಒಂದೂವರೆ ಗಂಟೆಗಳ ಕಾಲ ನಮ್ಮನ್ನು ಉದ್ದೇಶಿಸಿ ಈ ಕುರಿತು ಮಾತನಾಡಲಿಕ್ಕಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಇದಾದ ಮೇಲೆ ಸರಿಸುಮಾರು ಮೂವತ್ ನಿಮಿಷ ತರ್ಟಿ ಮಿನಿಟ್ಸ್ ಟು ಫೋರ್ಟಿ ಮಿನಿಟ್ಸ್ ಸಂವಾದಕ್ಕೆ ಕ್ಯೂ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಎಗೆ ಅವಕಾಶ ಇದೆ ಸ್ನೇಹಿತರೆ ಎಲ್ಲರೂ ಕೂಡ ತಮ್ಮ ಪ್ರಶ್ನೆಗಳನ್ನ ಚಾರ್ಟ್ ಬಾಕ್ಸ್ ನಲ್ಲಿ ನಮೂದಿಸಿ ಮತ್ತು ನಾನು ಅದನ್ನ ರಾಯ್ ಅವರಿಗೆ ತಲುಪಿಸ್ತೇನೆ ಮತ್ತೊಮ್ಮೆ ಮೂರು ಫೋರಂಗಳ ಪರವಾಗಿ ಮತ್ತು ನೆರೆದಿರತಕ್ಕಂತಹ ಕೇಳುಗರು ತಾವ್ ನಾವೆಲ್ಲ ಇದ್ದೀವಿ ನಮ್ಮ ಪರವಾಗಿ ಅಹ್ ಬಹುಶಃ ಸಮಕಾಲೀನ ಬಿಜಾಪುರದ ಮೇಲೆ ಸಾಕಷ್ಟು ಕೆಲಸ ಮಾಡಿರುವ ಮಧ್ಯ ಯುಗದ ಬಿಜಾಪುರದ ಮೇಲೆ ಸಾಕಷ್ಟು ಕೆಲಸ ಮಾಡಿರ್ತಕ್ಕಂಥ ಸಮಕಾಲೀನ ವಿದ್ವಾಂಸ ರಾಯಲ್ ಫಿಶರ್ ಅವರಿಗೆ ನಾನು ನಿಮ್ಮೆಲ್ಲರ ಪರವಾಗಿ ಮತ್ತು ಮೂರು ಫೋರಂಗಳ ಪರವಾಗಿ ಹೃತ್ಪೂರ್ವಕವಾದ ಸ್ವಾಗತವನ್ನು ಕೋರ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೇನೆ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ರಾಯ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಪ್ರದೀಪ್ ಅನ್ಫಾರ್ಚುನೇಟ್ಲಿ ಐ ಡು ನಾಟ್ ಸ್ಪೀಕ್ ಕನ್ನಡ ಸೊ ಐ ವಿಲ್ ಟೇಕ್ ಯು ವರ್ಡ್ about your presentation but first of all thank you so much for contacting me and, and for inviting me to to speak to a uh, colleagues uh, in in india and in karnataka in particular um I, it's it's a part of india that i find one of the really most interesting um and in my uh, research i'm looking more at the northern parts of the states um, in addition to a uh, neighboring telangana and maharashtra and all this space will come quite a lot in my
colleagues in India, it's one of those things that I'm pretty sure we, we, we need to do much more of it and, and um, to, to exchange knowledge about this fascinating region. So uh, let me start. I will share the screen now. Uh, I hope you can see it okay. Um, first thing, um, from what I figured out uh, from Pradeep's uh, generous introduction, um, the work that I'm presenting now is based on uh, my recent book. It was published a few months ago by Edinburgh University Press. This is the uh, cover. Um, unfortunately, we do not have yet an Indian edition, but hopefully we will be able to uh, produce one soon. Um, and from this book, I am starting to thinking about my, my next project that will focus, hopefully, more particularly on uh, Bijapur in around the turn of the 17th century, and in particular, Ibrahim Adil Shah II, who ruled from 1580 to 1627. So quite a substantial uh, reign, almost half a century. And he is, in my opinion, one of the most enigmatic and fascinating uh, political figures in uh, the history of India in that period. Um, sometimes compared to um, Akbar, I'm not sure that it's the right comparison and that I'm very pleased about it. We will get to it later in the talk. And let me start from, oh, 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 what I'm going to do is to first present some of the kind of confusing facts about Ibrahim, um, about his image as a ruler and how he is remembered. And from that, because I have quite a long time here, um, at which I'm, I'm very much uh, thankful for the uh, Bengaluru Historian Society for, for, for giving me so much time to present and, and develop my ideas so well. Uh, I will go back in time quite a few centuries and start presenting aspects of the long history of the Western Deccan until we get back to Bijapur. And, and by that I'm trying to present or to position the Sultanate as a whole and Ibrahim in particular in a series of traditions that link him both to those uh, trans-regional networks that take him outside uh, India towards the Muslim world, in particular Iran, but also link him to different layers of culture and history of the Deccan itself. Um, so I will start uh, now with a uh, defining. Um, as you can see now on the screen, I hope, uh, in this very famous painting um, hosted at the British Museum in London, we see Ibrahim Adil Shah II um, in a very peculiar way that we really don't know from many other Muslim rulers uh, in India. Uh, as you can see, the Sultan is wearing saffron and white. Um, he's adorned with golden scarves. Um, on his right hand, he's holding a green handkerchief. Um, and on the left hand, he holds castanets. Um, maybe it is a reference to his love of music and maybe it's a sign of his um, sympathies towards Hindu devotionalism because we do know it from certain bhakti traditions. Um, even more intriguing is that around the neck, you can see that he's wearing um, a necklace of Rudraksha. So those dry uh, beads associated with um, Hindu piety. It's not a Muslim practice at all. Um, the art historian uh, Deborah Hutton suggests that this painting presents the Sultan as basically an ideal Sufi seeker and lover. But, and you can notice the building in the background, um, the, the artist put him or placed him very much firmly in a Bijapuri setting. We can recognize the style and anyone who visited Bijapur 
can, uh, can recognize that it, it really looks like the building's there. But at the same time, we have all these kind of Hindu sensitivities to this painting. Ibrahim himself expressed intimate familiarity with Indi culture. Let's examine quickly those two verses um, that Ibrahim himself wrote. He describes one raga, uh, the Bhairava raga, and he said Bhairava has a tilak of camphor on his white brow and the moon. He has three eyes. In his dreadlocks, he bears the Ganges like a crown. In one hand, he holds a skull. In the other one, a, a, in the other one, a trident. He rides the bull. His body is white. He is Lord Shiva. Um, for audiences versed in Indic culture, the description corresponds very well with the common iconographic feature of Shiva, um, one of whose manifestations is, of course, Bhairava. Ibrahim even positions himself, himself very explicitly in this Indic world. In the very famous verse, uh, he states, and I quote, Ibrahim's lineage, the god and guru Ganapati, is his father, and pure Sarasvati is his mother. This is probably the best known image of the Sultan, and it was repeated time and again in the historiography, but it is not the only one. His court poet, Maulana Nuruddin Muhammad Zuhuri, who died in 1615, um, who is considered by many among the most important Persian po poets to have worked in India in all periods, declares, how can any statement offer sufficient thanks for the gift of friendship that made Ibrahim one of the servants at God's table, uh, God's table of uh, companions in Persian, the term is Khane Khalil. How uh, can the tongue sing this praise, which the Prophet Muhammad himself admitted uh, inability to perform? Uh, placing the Sultan in an explicitly Muslim environment Zuhuri creates a parallel between the Sultan and his namesake, the Quranic prophet Ibrahim, known in Muslim traditions as God's friend, Khalid. Others promoted a particular Shiite image. Ibrahim's court his, uh, historian, the famous Firishta, reports that while campaigning in late 1595, the Sultan, and I quote, encamped to perform the rituals of mourning uh, over the Sultan of Martyrs, leader of nobles and kings, Imam Hussein. Peace be upon him, which is, of course, a direct reference to the Shi uh, rite of mourning or Tazia in uh, Muharram or in the Ashura, the 10th day of the month of Muharram. Another Shia uh, reference uh, appears on a copper coin from Ibrahim's time bearing the inscription, and you can see it on the left side, Rulami Ali Murtaza, which means slave of Ali. Uh, Murtaza is, is a very common uh, name for Ali or accompanies uh, the name Ali, uh, who is considered to be the first Shia Imam. We can stop the pre presentation here for a bit and um, let's, let, let's think about these kind of two directions. Which of the two images best describes Ibrahim Adil Shah II and his court in Northern Karnataka. Was he a pious Muslim ruler inspired by the Sharia or a syncretic ruler that took on board Indic, even Hindu elements in shaping his rule? And the conflict here is very interesting in particular when we consider that Ibrahim is called Khalil or uh, identified as Ibrahim uh, the prophet who is most, most associated with a monotheism. So in this case, placing Ibrahim as the monotheist while playing with images of Shiva is very, very challenging in a way. So in other words, war, was he God's friend or Khalil or was he Sarasvati's son? For many scholars, there was a, a very 
easy definitive answer to these questions. Ibrahim is often presented as a liberal, Sufi loving and rather romantic ruler um, whose actions position him firmly within the local culture of the Deccan. Those, uh, uh, through this complex image of Ibrahim, um, in this lecture, I will follow the political language and public image uh, of, of Ibrahim and Bijapur as a whole and how it develops. So my assumption here is that it's actually um, some sort of accumulation of layer upon layer of political signifiers, symbols, identities, and also territorial way of thinking that culminated in the way that Ibrahim projected himself in different ways. The question is how far do we need to go in the past to start understanding this um, large story? In the historiography of India, and I'm repeating things that I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with, um, there is a common model following colonial writings that divides Indian history into three parts. The Hindu part, later was identified as ancient. The Muslim part, or the Muslim period, later identified as medieval. And the British period, later to be modified as modern. Um, this model was first suggested by uh, James Mill, in his History of British India in 1817. But this, he didn't come up with this model. Of course, it's a European model for European history, first introduced by the Florentine, uh, Florentine early Renaissance historian, Leonardo Bruni, who died in 1444. So we see this kind of European way of thinking of their own past and trying to impose it on India. As most of the historians focused on North India as the main region of interest, and all of us who are interested in the South know that we have to chase after um, traditions that are applied to the North and then assumed to reflect the entirety of the subcontinent, and Mill and his followers set the transition between the Hindu and the Muslim periods to around 1200. While the labels of the periods are debated, and I want to mention briefly just the uh, Indian Historical Congress that challenged it by presenting it as um, not Hindu and Muslim, but ancient and medieval, going back very close to, to Bruni's original uh, early 15th century definition, there is not much challenging of the periodization itself. Now, the Deccan version takes us more or less to 1300, so a century behind, or the appearance of the forces of Delhi Sultanate in this region as the transition. We see it, for example, in this wonderful and most important edited two volumes called History of Medieval Deccan, edited by um, um, H.K. Sherwani and P.M. Joshi, published in the early 1970s in Hyderabad that exactly put the line in 1295, uh, the first uh, excursion of the Khaljis into the Deccan. Um, although it's very tempting to follow this logic and it has clear merits, of course, that many things change and quite substantial things change, I find it very problematic. And the problem is, I, I see in it is that it offers this kind of very clean break from the past. It disconnects the locality from its own history and downplays elements of continuity. It also assumes that once we have new rulers, all the layers below the very, very thin layer of, of sultans now doesn't count and doesn't take part in, in shaping the history of the region. And this approach I reject, and this is why I really don't like this um, periodization. Now, of course, I won't deny them the, this change, but still, I think that if we really run, want to understand what was going on, we need to jump back in, into the past to centuries before 1300. So I therefore want to start briefly by going back to more or less the beginning of the uh, second millennium to the common era. Uh, let me uh, go back to the presentation here. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So the starting point, and it's as good as any other starting point that we can think of because everything is connected to what before, but I wanted to, to go back to around the turn of the uh, second a millennium when we see the south of the Deccan and, and further south divided along clear lines of north versus south. The north was uh, ruled by the western Chalukyas of Kalyani, um, so their center was in northern Karnataka. Um, they emerged around 970 after the collapse of the Rashtrakutas. Further south, we, we see the emergence of the Cholas of uh, Tamil Nadu. The border more or less ran along the familiar lines of the Krishna, uh, the Krishna Tungabha, uh, Tungabhadra rivers, um, with the usual fight over the Raichur Doab in between those rivers that many of you are familiar from the work of uh, Richard Eaton. The, the situation or this division has changed, and this is the first kind of two contradictory divisions of the Deccan that I want to offer. And this is because the Cholas started campaigning north along the eastern coast, making it, uh, absorbing Andhra or coastal Andhra, going into Orissa and even having campaigns as far north as Bengal in the beginning of the 11th century. Uh, there is the famous story of fluting the, the image of Shiva of one of the temples in Bengal and bringing it back uh, to Tamil Nadu. At the same time, the Western Chalukyas started advancing south, but on the western part of the Deccan, uh, absorbing what we call the Karnatak Plateau, so the part of the Deccan Plateau south of the Krishna Tungabhadra uh, rivers. This created this kind of east-west element. And remember this kind of map because we will see that the Western Deccan as a space will come time and again in our talk um, in, in, in maybe surprising places. This situation, uh, this map lasted for about a century, most of the it, uh, 11th century, by, but by the early 12th century, uh, the Deccan has witnessed a series, a, a collapse of those two empires and saw the emergence of regional kingdoms. Most important of these were the uh, Yadavas of Devgiri, so their center was in northern uh, Maharashtra, the Kakatiyas of uh, uh, Warangal, so their center was uh, in Telangana, the Pandyas, the Tamil Pandyas, and for our interest in uh, Karnataka, of course, the Hoysalas with their center in Dwarasamudra or Halabidu uh, today in uh, southern Karnataka. This is very interesting because we don't have, and that is another point that should, we should remember, we don't have kind of clear marking of territorial regions for northern Karnataka. Um, and this is where things are getting a little bit confusing. We will get back to this point later. Um, I don't want to get into too many details about those regional kingdom and I, I will stop the, the presentation here just to consider some of the general features that developed in this period and I find very uh, important for the understanding of uh, the Sultanate of Bijapur later in the 16th, 17th century. So first of all, the political system that developed between the dynasties was very dynamic. The kingdoms constantly changed alliances between one another and accordingly, of course, changed a lot of enemies on the way and often meddled in each other's uh, affairs. Consequently, the kingdoms were in the state of dynamic equilibrium, constant changing of borders, but at the same time, quite um, stable core regions. So Devgiri would not change hands, but the border between the Yadavas and the Kakatiyas will move quite um, often. A second point, uh, that I want to mention is that the economic and ecological base of each uh, state started moving 
inland. So if we have much more centers along the coast until the 10th, 11th century, from this period, we see that we have great economic and political centers up on the plateau. We saw it even before with Kalyana, the capital of the Western Chalukya, being at the center of the Deccan Plateau. This trend continued into the regional kingdoms. A third point that I want to mention is that we see in this period major change in social order of things. Um, more, let's say, uh, populations that were before marginals got, back, got into the center. We see semi-settled population now being settled and absorbed into the political system of the sultanate, of, of sorry, the kingdoms, not yet sultanates, of course. Um, just to mention uh, briefly, Cynthia Talbot's terrific work on uh, the Kakatiya uh, expansion inland, the formation of Telugu as a region that is very much identified with language and certain territory and the emergence of a um, lower um, caste uh, members as now military uh, elites known locally as Nayaka and then their change within the, the, the system. So we see quite a lot of flux in this region, both uh, economically but also socially. The last point, which I think is the most interesting. Uh, I, I will dwell a little bit more on this. Um, and this is the uh, linguistic cultural change. If we go back to Western Chalukyan time, the empire relied very much to, um, on, on principles of hierarchy, kingship, and a certain understanding of the dharmic duty of kings, all structures that very much relied on teachings and also identification with the world of Sanskrit. This changed in the first centuries of the second millennium. The scholar, the American literary scholar, Sheldon Pollock, who is a very important scholar both in the world of Sanskrit studies but also in Canada, suggests uh, what we can see here is the emergence of vernaculars or the local spoken languages in roles that were previously occupied only by Sanskrit, including politics, literature, and uh, religious purposes. The process was more clearly pronounced in South India, where communities of speakers of Kannada first, and then Tamil, Telugu, and eventually Marathi, became increasingly aware of their vernacular as standing independently of Sanskrit, and even more so, became aware of the language as what signals them as political or social unit. Uh, back to the case of the Kakatiya, this is the uh, best studies, a studied case in that sense. And I'm, I'm going back to Cynthia Talbot, and she demonstrates how Telugu started filling this role of the marker of Kakatiya identity. So in that sense, the Kakatiyas made use the liberate use of the language in marking themselves as rulers of first Telangana and increasingly also Andhra and Rayalasima. Of course, this theory, as interesting and intriguing as it is, has quite a lot of critique. So first of all, scholars such as um, Vilcero Narayana Rao, who worked uh, on a literature of Telugu, suggest that it's very difficult to create these clear-cut regions between languages. And he brings examples, those sites in between languages, such as Tirupati or Sri Shailam, in which we can find for a very long time after this transition, patronage and literary activity in many languages. So multilingual environments continue to exist. A second point is that, um, if we have this kind of maybe clear idea about the Telugu land, we have a bit more problematic story in the Western Deccan. And I, I want to go back to the map for a second. Sorry, this map. Um, so Canada, we now developed early in the region of 
southern Karnataka and was used for both political use uh, by the Hoysalas, but also for spiritual purposes, uh, for example, around the yet to be called Virashaivism. Marathi developed later and was confined to the northern uh, Yadava territories around the capital of, of Devgiri, which is today Daulatabad, the region of Aurangabad, uh, Elora, so northern Maharashtra. And even this limited use was a promoted um, or limited use of Marathi for political purpose that was later and, and much less developed than the Canada space. It was uh, promoted by the Yadavas who oddly came from Karnataka, not from Maharashtra originally. Um, the interesting thing is that in between these uh, cores, which are very far apart, we have a large territory that is in a way almost no man's land. We don't know where to position it. Is it a Marathi land or Canada land? Today we have an answer, but this is the result of process that lasted for many, many centuries. But for the period we are talking here, it's not very clear. A third point that I would like to, to point out as problematic is um, what happened to Sanskrit. According to Pollock, Sanskrit declined and almost disappeared from these kind of roles, but we all know that this is not the case. Um, and to follow scholars such as David Schulman or Egal Bronner, uh, who claimed that the rumors of the death of Sanskrit were way too early. Sanskrit continue, continue, continued to be practiced and continued to be a very important language, not only in religious um, sense, but also in literary and cultural. So at the eve of Delhi's invasion, we see contradictory processes that shaped the Deccan. We see dividing lines to north and south, but also east and west. We see concept of all the Kanye uh, or even all Indian traditions persisting, by the way, of engagement with Sanskrit, with its aesthetic and also spiritual values, by the side of um, the emergence of vernaculars as markers of some sort of territorial identity, cultural identity. Some groups who identify themselves with the language were completely religious and not political. Um, there is a wonderful example of the Mahanubhava um, sect in central Maharashtra, or central northern, around the Godavari, who saw themselves as the speakers of Marathi, which is spoken in Maharashtra, this is their land, and they say where neither Telugu nor Kannada are spoken, but only Marathi, but they did not have any political significance for that. For them, it was a spiritual association. For others, like the Kakatiyas, there is much clearer association of vernacular and political identity. At this point, we can start considering Delhi's armies arriving in the Deccan. First for plunder from 1320 under the Tulaks, we know permanent conquest, um, eliminating the Yadavas, Hoysalas, Kakatiyas, and Pandya's kingdoms. But local society with its values persisted. Under the Tulaks, the North-South Division re-emerged. Um, Richard Eaton suggests that the Northern Deccan was ruled more directly from Delhi, and we see the settlement of Muslim commanders, um, and later with the famous story of the foundation of Daulatabad as secondary capital, also forced migration of Muslim elites from the North into the Northern Deccan. In the South, we see indirectly ruled territories, usually by local magnates and chieftains, some of whom served the Hoysalas before, most famous of these are, of course, a, a, the, the Sangama brothers, first serving the uh, Hoysalas, and then and we have very strong indication that they did serve as tributaries of Delhi for a couple of decades. This attempt of the Turlak to rule the South was very short-living. It's about... A, five years before they started the facing rebellions, uh, 20 years or 25 years until they lost control over the Deccan completely. Um, 
think about it as a comparison to Aurangzeb's campaign to the Deccan that are very famous, but the Mughal control over the Deccan was extremely short. It was about 30 to 40 years before they lost. So we see a very clear parallel here. Um, by 1347, the Turlaks had to leave the Deccan, and we see uh, the formation of two twins, basically, in a way. Bahaman is north of the Krishna Tungabhadra, um, Vijayanagara to its south, both emerging in a way from the system, say, uh, created by Delhi, but all depending very much on the past and the, the values and what they found on the ground for their survival. And we will see uh, in the coming minutes, um, we will get back to the point of how it worked. The Bahamanis, and I will look more at the Bahamanis here, they follow the administrative um, precedence from Delhi, but, uh, and, and I'm following here SK Sinha, they also had quite strong reliance on land revenue systems uh, that survived from the pre-Islamic times, so from the regional kingdoms that I mentioned before. More generally, with the growing competition between the Bahamanis and Vijayanagara, we see the Gajapatis of Orissa, Gujarat is, is popping up uh, at one point, that we see uh, increasing recruiting of Hindu elites, both military and administrative. As a matter of fact, at one point, we see this great ethos created in the Bahamani kingdom of the very open, very inclusive ruler. In particular, we see it under Firuz Shah, uh, who ruled from 1397 to 1422. Uh, he said, and publicly it was pronounced, that he spoke Arabic, Persian, Turkish, but also Telugu, Kannada, and Marathi. His harem had women from all cultures and societies and places. Um, and he even said to have married a daughter of Devaraya I of Vijayanagara. How much of it is true is always problematic, but we do know that they saw a value in promoting the idea of this inclusive kind of kingship. And this remained, this kind of tradition, even if it was contested, remained um, quite alive and, and was transferred into uh, the kingdom of Bijapur, uh, to which we will get later. Now, the power of the, uh, of the Bahamanis very much, even though they were very inclusive, relied heavily in the early stages on a group that is known in the sources or as the Khanis. Now, the Khanis in the Persian sources, at least, is a very particular group. These are Muslims who, many of them arrived originally from the north with the Turlaks, others are local converts, uh, converts to Islam, but what is common to all of them is that they saw themselves as the people of the Deccan they were sometimes a little bit suspicious towards um, outsider Muslims. So we see this instinctive hostility towards uh, migrants at times, not at all cases, but anyways, we see that we have this kind of emerging all the Kani identity. It's not all the Kani we have to emphasize here. It's North the Kani identity, North of the Krishna that kind of ignores the vernacular lines, but builds itself. They even started creating their own language known as Dakani. It's quite different than the modern um, Urdu of the Deccan. This is more related to later um, developments that came from the north. But we do have quite a few texts surviving, mostly literary texts that were created from the 15th century and in particular from the late 16th and into the 17th century. Example was Kitab and Auras, from which I read the verses wrote by or written by Ibrahim um, himself. Another element of this Dekani society was their association with Sufis. So we have a very strong, this kind of mystical Sunni element. Again, started from the north, but got his own shape and form in the Deccan. The most important uh, saint uh, is, of course, uh, Khoja Bandanava's nicknamed Gisu de Raz, 
uh, who settled in Gulbarga more or less in 1400, maybe 1399, and became a very, very important um, political social actor. So by the late reign of Firuz Shah, we see that within the Sultanate, we have a very, very strong, uh, con uh, let's say, a, a strong and powerful group of Muslim elites who see themselves as the Khanis, but also they have kind of independent agendas and they can create powerful opposition to that of um, the, the sultans. This brought the successor of Firuz, his brother Ahmad I, to take far-reaching uh, steps, basically. He decided that Gulbarga is a little bit too much controlled by those Dekanis and it's intrigue-ridden and he cannot control from, from there. So he moved to a new capital, Bidar, which was quite remote and not very important the, uh, until that time. But, and that's a very interesting point, it's very close to Kalyani, the old Western Chalukya capital. This Kalyani will, and, and the whole Western Chalukya heritage will pop up time and again, even though we are talking about Muslim rulers. They did not ignore this past at all. A second thing that, uh, that Sultan Ahmad I did was to engineer a completely new elite. And the concept was if he brings elites from the outside world, mostly from Iran, they will be loyal to him. They won't have local connections. So he created or engineered an elite, Persian speaking, very much connected to those trans-regional networks uh, to counteract or counterbalance those Dekanis. Um, those were following not some kind of local Islamic tradition, but they were very much Persian. They spoke Persian, they wrote in Persian, and they maintained these trans-regional networks very much alive, linking statecraft with trade, in particular commodities like horses, war horses, the best ones are um, imported, um, and also artistic and literary issues. And this is a very important point. The ever-growing position of Islamic and Persian at scholarship, art and literature under royal patronage is dated from maybe started under Firoz Shah, but definitely um, from Ahmad I, we see it expanding. So by that time, in addition to all those dividing lines or, or let's say, a spatial identities of East versus West, North versus South, and the vernacular identities. On top of that, we need to consider three directions of the Bahamani Sultanates. And these three directions will become a constant into the Deccan Sultanates that succeeded the Bahamanis. First of all, is the idea that we have local Muslim identity focused on the entirety of the Northern Deccan. The second, line connects those courts to the trans-regional networks of the Muslim East, heavily Persian speaking, but also with strong Arabic uh, content. And the third is never losing sight of the locality and the Hindu population with its own traditions, ideas, uh, sensitivities. Now, this diversity offers uh, offered to the rulers great advantages of flexibility, but also created social tensions among the elites. Good rulers or good management were able to keep everything at bay. But when the central administration weakened, was, uh, is where we see eruption of this kind of tensions. And this was the case in the 1480s, after 20 years of the rulership of Sultan Muhammad III in the 1460s and 70s, he died in 82, and no less so the very famous vizier, um, Mahmoud Gawan Gilani. You can still see the madrasa he built in Bidar. It's still standing there and it's an absolutely spectacular building. Um, they died in proximity to one another, and then we see a process of collapse that was really, really quick. So within a decade or so, Bidar doesn't control much anymore. And this is the beginning of the Deccan Sultanates. I want to uh, share the screen again. 
just to see the map of those uh, sultanates. So they occupy the regions of the northern Deccan, the old Bahmani territories. Of course, as we all know, we should take maps with a grain of salt. I'm not sure about the boundaries, but it gives us more or less indication what we are talking about. So by the uh, turn of the 16th century, we see the emergence of four de facto independent uh, dynasties. The Nizam Shah of Ahmad Nagar, the Adil Shah of Bijapur, the uh, uh, Imad Shah of Berar, and the Qutub Shah of Golconda, whereas Bidar, the, the ex-capital, is becoming um, kind of managed by the Baridis, who never able to establish a real sultanate there. They actually gave patronage to the very, very weak Bahamani sultan until his death, the last one, Khalilullah, in 1538, and ever then they were quite struggling. The first decades were quite um, problematic for the sultanates, in part because it coincided with the height of power of two neighbors. In the south, Vijayanagara under Krishna Devaraya and we will return to him because he was remembered in Bijapur very well. And in the north, uh, or the northwest, we have Gujarat under Bahadur Shah, both trying to push their way into the northern Deccan, or the Persianate Deccan. But by 1530, both of them lost a lot of power, at least for some time. And uh, giving the, the Sultanates time to reorganize and create very um, powerful or at least very stable courts, in particular Ahmad Nagar, Bijapur and Golconda, the three important ones. The situation between them was very similar to what we see about the regional kingdoms in the uh, 12th, uh, 13th, sorry, mostly 13th century, with this kind of dynamic equilibrium. Once again, the core regions are safe, uh, stable and the regions, the borderlines between them are uh, not stable, changing all the time and in addition to that the struggle about the right or Doab, um, for example the 1520 war that Richard Eaton talked about uh, recently. There is one point that I want you to note about the map, and this is the core regions of the Sultanates and where they sit in relationship to the vernacular core regions of the kingdoms I've mentioned before. Golconda sits very comfortably within the Telugu lands. The capital Golconda, which is today, was absorbed inside Hyderabad, uh, is not too far from Warangal, so the old Kakatiya capital. Ahmad Nagar is about the same distance from Daulatabad, and Daulatabad continued, or, or the old uh, Yadava capital of Devgiri, and Daulatabad remained a very important stronghold uh, throughout the Sultanate's days. Bijapur is stuck exactly in the no man's land I uh, described before. It's away from the core region of uh, the Marathi language, even though it incorporated southern Maharashtra, it's also quite far away from Dwara Samudra, Halabidu, and the core regions of Kannada, even though it, Bijapur itself, Vij uh, Vijayapuram, is in northern Karnataka. And this is part of the problem that we were facing here. The competition between them uh, became intensified in the 1540s when Ramaraya took over Vijayanagara as the de facto leader, even though he was not a Raya by himself. Um, and in this period after 1542, that we see Vijayanagara being increasingly involved in the uh, issues north of the Deccan. Now, it is very interesting to, uh, or very tempting to see it yet another indication of the Muslims against the Hindus. But, and I actually counted and tried to analyze the wars in this period. And you can see that in this chart. You see that the war 
was mostly and most commonly between Ahmad Dagar and Bijapur. Vijay and Nagar joined in most cases, at least until 1565, either on the side of Ahmad Nagar or on the side of Bijapur. So we have a story of the Western Deccan here. Look how remote from this story is Golconda with much significantly less involvement in this, these affairs. This whole competition was who is going to be the strong man of the Western Deccan. And we see that part of it is competition who is going to control Kalyani. And it was expressed quite explicitly. So when Ramaraya tries to position Vijayanagara as the strongest power in the South, he does it in part by associating himself to this kind of memory of the Western Chalukya, another sign of the continuation of this memory. What happened in 1565 then? This is, of course, the Battle of Talikota or Banihati, in which the four sultanates of Ahmad Nagar, Berar, Bijapur, and Golconda um, allied themselves against Vijayanagara. The difference between that and all the other alliances, and we saw quite a lot of four versus one alliances before, in which Vijayanagara was among the four, ended up in a decisive victory for the first time. And Vijayanagara was defeated and started this very long process of um, withdrawal from the Deccan. So this leaves us in a very interesting situation here in which we have five sultanates fighting, fighting among or struggling among one another, two of them with clear vernacular possibilities and one not, and the lingering competition over the Western Deccan. Now with this very long background, and sorry that it was so long, but I think that it's necessary to understand Bijapur as part of the Deccan. Bijapur is within the history of the Western Deccan, and that's my main point here, that I want to go back to Bijapur, the, the case of Bijapur particularly. Now, the history of Bijapur sits exactly between those lines that I've marked before. Uh, with certain periods promoting one of those directions, both possibilities, potentialities, and other periods, other sultans promote other ideas. The founder of the dynasty, Yusuf, uh, who died in 1510, was a Turkic migrant from Western uh, Iran, some even say, uh, and there is a story that they try to promote, that he was the secret brother of the Ottoman Sultan uh, Mehmet, the conqueror of Istanbul in 1453, but I somehow doubt it. Um, he rose to power in this factional environment of the late Bahamani period, which means that he leaned towards his own people, the foreigners. Elite society, though, maintained its blend of um, locals and foreigners, um, leading to occasional struggles, um, in particular under his successors, Ismail, um, who ruled from 1510 to 1534. Uh, for most part, we see the uh, foreigners or the Iranians having the uh, upper hand, and I'm using the term foreigners because this is the term that the chronicles that they actually, people of their group, wrote, used, Rariban in Persian. A, an interesting but dubious depiction of Ismail's intention is by the 17th century historian Fuzuni Astrabadi, um, one of, who served one of his successors, uh, Ibrahim II's son, um, Muhammad, was the patron, uh, who stated, um, and I quote, um, this sorry, the Sultan was saying, and here I quote, I was born in the Deccan and has never seen any other country, but he adds later, um, he had a good grasp of Persian, Turkish, and other languages, but was not at all inclined towards the Indian languages. The description is actually nastier in terms of he never inclined, he didn't like the sight of the Indians and the sound of them, but it is exaggerated. How do we know? Because we see the continuity of 
local practices even under his court. Those came much more to the foreground under his son, Ibrahim I, not to be confused with our hero, Ibrahim II. Ibrahim I uh, is identified as shifting towards the Deccanis, uh, dismissing most foreigners from the service except for a powerful few. Again, I'm not very pleased with this kind of description because the foreigners will show up again and I, I doubted that if they felt unsafe or that the place is not for them, they would have returned in such great numbers under his successor, uh, Ali. So we see increasing introduction of Brahmin, uh, Brahmins into local administration, changing of language of revenue collection and judicial records to um, vernacular. So we have records in uh, Marathi and probably also Canada for the southern parts. Um, not much work was done and I hope that any of you in the audience um, has any direction here that I, I would love to hear about that. Uh, the inclusion of local elites, of course, accompanied with a great uh, in introduction or, or absorption of local traditions um, and symbols into the political language. And I'm going back to Richard Eaton, his work alongside Philip Wagoner, demonstrate how elements and inscriptions from the Western Chalukya capital, from Kalyani, were moved and installed in one of the gates of Bijapur citadel. Uh, in particular, those associated with uh, the two most famous rulers or rayas of the Western Chalukyas, um, Someshvara II and Vikramaditya VI. This is a very good testimony that the memory of the Western Chalukya was very much alive even in the 16th century under Muslim rulers. They are around, they are never disappearing. And, and once it was introduced so forcefully into the system, it was there to stay. Ibrahim's son and successor, Ali I, is a good demonstration for it. He is remembered as a Shia ruler who preferred the foreigners and everything was Persian in his period, but it's not the case. If we read carefully evidence from his time, we see that Hindus were very important and local Indic culture was promoted. For example, there are quite a few inscriptions from his times in Persian by pandits, especially on the walls of the city of Bijapur, including some of them bringing this kind of very clear Shia talismanic statements like la, uh, la fata ila ali, so there is no youth like Ali, a very common talismanic uh, slogans who are associated with uh, the Shia creed of Islam. The library of um, Ali, um, of, of which he was very, very fond, and that there are fascinating descriptions about his library, was run by a Brahmin well into the late part of his rule. So it's not even something that he succeeded from his father. And even more curious, I think, is a piece called Nujum al Ulum, or The Stars of Knowledge. It's this encyclopedic uh, compilation of astrology and astronomy with, uh, it is full of both Islamic and Indic concepts with Hellenic and Central Asian and Persian, but it's very clear that it's kind of associating him with the locality. And Emma Flatt, who worked on this work, suggests that it's even more interesting. He, this work promoted claims or astrological claims for possession of Ali over territories that were not under his rule. They were to his north and south. Not surprising, we are still, or once again, we see the Western Deccan playing here. He didn't claim for possession of Telangana. He, it was Maharashtra, it was Karnataka, but outside his direct rule. So in short, the political language of Bijapur, even though it jumped in between um, association with those trans-regional networks and Persianate culture and Islamicate culture on one hand, and on the one hand with Indic tradition, but also with localized Muslim tradition, all those elements continued to exist and played between themselves all the time, regardless of 
the identity and the inclination of the Sultan himself. And I think that it's an important point to make here is that it's very easy, or, or we tend, I think that historians tend to say, okay, this ruler has this kind of incl inclinations or interest, it means that everything aligned with it. But the same way that, for example, for North India, for the Mughal Empire, about the same time that we are talking, by the side of Abul Fazal, who represents very much of Akbar's delete, we have, uh, we have Badawni with his clear rejection, and both of them worked within the same environment in the Deccan too. Those circles created much more diverse a uh, culture uh, than associated and only to the personal inclinations of a ruler would reveal. Now with this in mind, let us return to Ibrahim and for the rest of this uh, lecture, we will focus on him. Uh, we have seen that Ibrahim had the image of the, uh, both the Persianate king and also um, the localized, the son of Sarasvati, as I called it before. Let's look a little bit more in um, detail. So this political language that was created by the Persianate members of his court are very much linking him to the Persianate world. We can find these tropes familiar. So any, any reader in the Safavid court of Iran or the Mughal court of North India, let alone the courts of Golconda and Ahmadnagar, would identify them. It is the same language. Many important painters uh, in Persia, uh, of the Persian tradition created um, works under his regime. We will see an, a, a fascinating example later. And we have the poets, of course, uh, Zuhuri that I mentioned before, Shakibi and Kumi, great two historians, Firishta, I mentioned him before, probably the most famous historian of the Deccan, of the Deccan Sultanate. But also, and we will see more for the project of Ibrahim, uh, relevant is the work of Rafiuddin Shirazi. These literati then link the court of Ibrahim um, and its intellectual milieus to the rest of the Muslim East. These connections created certain kingly image of the kind that uh, we know from other Islamic courts. We saw before that Ibrahim was known as Khalil, friend of God. Uh, in another place, Zuhuri calls him as the Kaaba and Qibla, so the direction of prayer for Muslims a very interesting connection because in Islamic tradition, the one who is uh, attributed to with the construction of the Kaaba in, in Mecca is the prophet Ibrahim. So this connection with Ibrahim is, that, is done in different ways. Uh, elsewhere, Zuhuri states that, and I quote, he's the king of apostles, the crown for the head of all, through whose favor the harp of existence produces music. So we have a connection to the Shia Imams here, but also to music. And music is a motif that we will encounter time and again. His court historian, um, Firishta, that I mentioned before, even calls him Sahib Kiran, or Lord of the Auspicious Conjunction. It's a Timurid, Central Asian, a kind of millenarian title, that was used mostly for emperors. So we saw uh, Shah Jahan, the Mughal emperor, known as Sahib Kiran. Timur, Tamerlane himself was Sahib Kiran. But here we see a use of this imperial millenarian title for Ibrahim himself. This association with the Persianate culture was not widely acknowledged. In an oft-quoted report from the Mughal ambassador to Bijapur, Asad Beg Kazvini, who visited Bijapur in the early 17th century, uh, he commented on the Sultan's preference of Marathi and his broken Persian. He uses the word shikasta. This claim is not a neutral one if we consider that in the Mughal court, and I'm following here the argument of Muzaffar Alam, Persian was not only a language, but also a marker of civility and culture. Saying that Ibrahim does not speak Persian is in the, the language of the Mughal court of the time means that he is not worthy to be a king. So it's a very political in nature. Um, I just have to say, to 
counteract it is that Firishta himself goes at great length to describe how Ibrahim made a huge effort to learn Persian and had excellent knowledge of that language. And also that he himself asked Firishta to write the history in that language. And I'm not sure how much we can trust this direction because it's as political as Asad Beg's um, report, but we can see that at least for courtly writers, it is important to depict Ibrahim as part of this Persianate world. Um, now, a curious engagement of this kind um, does not still make most of the evidence we have. More than this, we have uh, his association with the um, local in the culture. Very important um, aspect of it is what is called in that period, and it's a very curious kind of term called Nauras. Nauras is a um, um, kind of a pun. Um, in, in a way, because it means two different things in two different languages. In Persian, Nauras means newly arrived, and it's his youth, his uh, freshness, but it is written exactly the same way in Nastalik, in script, as Navarasa, or the nine rasas so much associated with aesthetics, and in particular in music, in Indic culture. And it's not a coincidence that he used those two Persian writers actually acknowledge it quite explicitly. Part of the things that associated with the Naras, other than um, we have it appearing this name in many, many places, is actually a holiday or, or festival called Eid Naras, or the Eid or the holiday of the Naras. I want to follow a little bit on this. I think that this is one of the most curious things, and through that I want to unpack what he tried to create in his rule. So I'm, I'm sharing the text because it's a bit long, but I think that it's worth reading it in full. And here it's my translation of, of Rafiuddin Shiraz's uh, chronicle. Friday that falls on the ninth day of the month is called Eden Auras. Many celebrations take place on that day an assembly or majlis is held to which the general public are admitted. Performers sing, recite, and orate uh, to show their thanksgiving, of course, to the Sultan. Nobles and commoners arrive, joining in rows, seat a row after row. To acknowledge the honor of the service, they momentarily stop playing music and singing, sit down according to order, then resume their chatter. Musk, saffron, and other perfumes are scattered in abundance. Trays upon trays of fruit uh, are stacked upon one another. Plenty of food is distributed. Dignitaries, nobles, military chiefs, performers, and dancers, who are Ibrahim's distinguished disciples, sit in groups according to proximity and rank. When they finish eating, they arise and leave, and another group, group come in. When all are satisfied, the other disciples, servants, and the poor take as much as they can. On the last day, many of his majesty's people are, uh, and disciples arrive. His agents in the provinces are asked to attend. They are presented with robes of honor and set to go back. Endless presents are gifted. The army of the Nauras recite, sing, and play their instruments. Now, the events uh, aimed at confirming the Sultan's role in the kingdom, um, quite, I mean, quite obviously that it's kind of putting him in the center of everything. It's expressed by proximity, rank, and etiquette. We know it definitely from the Mughal context, the idea of the, the distance or the proximity to the ruler as signifier of rank. Other elements are less familiar from the odd timing, Friday in the ninth of the month. We don't know which calendar even it is used. It's never written. Um, or uh, the location of, of the event, it's in the purpose-built Nauras Mahal, 
as the epicenter of Ibrahim's ceremonial suburb of Nawrathpur. Furthermore, it was not a closed majlis because the commoners, the people, were allowed. This may bear resemblance a little bit to the darshan as practiced by Akbar. So my, uh, one may assume that Eden Aras is just, kind, just this kind of local manifestation of a known political idiom by a syncretic um, ruler. But I suggest actually a more radical interpretation of this whole event. And that will bring all the bits that I was talking about together. And this is, uh, Eden Aras is, I suggest, based at least in large part on the Mahanavami as celebrated in Vijayanagara. Um, now, this, the, the festival was central to articulating political power in the most important uh, power of the Deccan of the early 16th century, so in Vijayanagara. The uh, Mahanavami in Vijayanagara included a public court in which royal gifts were exchanged with members of the nobility, the ritualistic elements, including the darshan and the puja um, to the state deity, uh, which for part was even positioned by the side of the king, and processions which included music and dance. This sounds a little bit far-fetched, but I think that I can support this a little bit more carefully or more substantially. The incorp this incorporative ritual of the Mahanavami, if I'm using Burton Stein's phrase, associates the king with Rama, the focus of the Mahanavami, presenting the king as the warrior and as the source of riches under God's protection. Two places were the focus of this festival. One, is uh, the highly decorated uh, Mahanavami uh, Heba. We, we all know uh, the structure, it's still visible today. You can see it on the right side. And the second one is the uh, Ramachandra temple. The whole city, the, they created some access for this kind of ritual. Um, and the, after 1565 and the fall of Vijayanagara, the fall is a bit problematic term, but we don't have time to discuss it. Uh, we see transfer to other courts in South India, one of which was Mysore, where it continued to be practiced in a way under Haidar Ali and Tipu Sultan. This continuation suggests that maybe it was powerful enough ritual to make it to Bijapur. Let's look at Nawrathpur and Bijapur. The similarity between several aspects of Eden Nawras and the Mahanavami is striking. Both festivals focus on the public and ritualistic affirmation of the supreme position of the sovereign in his kingdom, manifested by the public audiences, reaffirmation of hierarchies, gifts, and darshan. Music and dance were important elements. The peculiar date chosen to Eden Aras, the ninth of the month might be related to the nine days of the Mahanavami, and that might also find its way to the number nine in now Ras. Uh, but um, also the center, the, the fact that the city is built around this ritual and there is clear markation in the center might be another implication. But there is other evidence that suggests that Bijapur actually used Vijayanagara as a model and that to support this theory. One of them is calling Bijapur or Vijayapura, city of victory, uh, associated with Ibrahim, is changing its name to Bidyapur or Vid, uh, Vidyapuram, city of knowledge. This is a uh, a very similar event to what happened to uh, Vijayanagara that at one point was called Vidyanagara. It's not clear what's the source, but one of the explanation that it was actually under Krishna Devaraya that it happened. So it's not in the long history that we have this transformation of the name. As a matter of fact, Krishna Devaraya is remembered in Bijapur as a very, very positive ruler. Let me quote here, sorry, um, a very short passage from uh, Shirazi again, describing Krishna Devaraya. He said that he was wise, akil, and just, adil king. 
Muslim commanders sought shelter with Krishna Raya and enjoyed his patronage. As long as they ate his salt and remained under his protection, they did not diverge from his well-wishing and devotion. This is not a description of Muslim ruler in a Muslim or Persian chronicle. A, 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 sorry, of a Hindu ruler. It's a very much description of a Muslim ruler with the right values of loyalty, wisdom, and just. Actually, Akhil and Adil are probably among the most common uh, descriptions of kings. So in, it, we see then that we have something about this kind of evoking Vijayanagara time and again under Ibrahim II. Um, the problem is that we don't have a content for this sanctity. Here is where I get a little bit more speculative, uh, so please bear with me a few more minutes. Um, first of all, we see that Ibrahim, or, or his writers, and also in documents, used the word, the adjective muqaddas, or sacred, to desc uh, describe Nauraspur. This title was not used lightly. As a matter of fact, I saw only two other places where it is used in that period. One of them is Gulbarga, where the shrine of Khoja Bandana was Gisuderaz, the most important Sufi saint of the Deccan lives. And the other one is Mashhad in Iran, which is very important for Shia veneration. The fact that um, Naraspur was called Muqaddas gives us a hint. But there are no Sufi um, sites in Naraspur, unlike Bijapur itself, which is dotted with them. Remember that Naraspur is outside Bijapur itself. We saw it in the map earlier. And the fact that there are almost no mosques in um, Naraspur that suggests that the source of sanctity must be someone else. And this is Ibrahim himself, but he's a Muslim ruler. We cannot call him or identify him with the deity. So this is done in a very odd way. And this is linking himself to music. This is done quite explicitly by Shirazi. He said that since a young age, the refuge of the world, which is a very common uh, nickname for a Muslim a ruler, was deeply involved in the pursuit of musical knowledge. He achieved great understanding and advance in science of music. If Venus, who is the celestial body in charge of music, had the capacity, she would have left the eternal abode of the third house and come to his threshold. I'm skipping here a bit. Then we say that we have, he's the messiah of wisdom, giving him a reason for a, a eternal life, anyone who, who listens to him, he attracts students, and he's actually by himself becomes the embodiment of music. This is a very odd uh, text, I think. Um, but it definitely positions uh, Ibrahim as the incarnation, in a way, of the music that he represents, and this is the source of some kind of sanctity. But we can take this even further. And this is a little bit uh, extreme, I think, in a way. We don't see it under other rulers in the Deccan. It is related to the music itself. Now, the following image that I'm going to show you is very much associated with Ibrahim. It is, a, and, and of course, with music. I will show you this image now. I, I, I'm sure that many have seen you. It is kept in the uh, city palace in Jaipur. The iconography is easily under, uh, I, it, it's very easy to identify that this is Saraswati, and it is identified as Saraswati throne. Uh, you can note that there is this elephant, I'll, I'll, I'll stress this here. You see that above the throne, we have this uh, elephant. And underneath it, there is the inscription. 
the inscription is exactly the verse that I've read uh, before, uh, Ibrahim's lineage, the God and, um, the God and Guru, Gan uh, Ganapati is his father, and Pure Saraswati in his mother. This, this, this verse appears there. I want to close, um, to close up on the uh, elephant, and you see that it's very similar to the image, the independent image to the left by uh, the same um, painter, Farouk Hussein. Sorry, I have a typo here in the name. I, I'm mistaken in the name. It's Farouk Hussein who created both images. In other words, above this kind of throne, we have some things that make sure that we will never miss the fact that it is Bijapur's throne, on which we have, with all her attributes, Saraswati, associated with the peacock underneath. She's holding the vena, she's holding a lotus, she's holding a book. The book is probably the Kitabe Nauras. But at the same time, the style is completely Iranian. So we have Saraswati sitting on the throne in uh, Bijapur. Why is it so important? So on one hand, we see the casting of Saraswati, of this very, very Indic, of course, goddess, in Persianate style of, of um, painting. So what uh, Kilan Overton very nicely coined is casting Saraswati in Solomonic terms. So turning it into some part of the Islamic language. But at the same time, we see a goddess sitting on the same throne that belongs to the ruler. Think again about the ceremony that we have seen or we have discussed about the Mahanavami in Vijayanagara. So in other sense, there is a very complicated and indirect way to even create this sanctity through music and associate the ruler, Ibrahim, with Saraswati in a very similar way that was done in the ceremony in Vijayanagara. So to, to conclude this, the language of kingship in Ibrahim's court was operating in many directions at the same time. It shared its idiom with the Indo-Islamic and Persian world um, that surrounds Bijapur in the subcontinent and outside, uh, including its very strong imperial tones. He's Sahib Kiran, he's the Lord of Auspicious Conjunction. But it also incorporated elements from the Indic world around him, both in terms of representation and ritual. The parallel language, uh, languages are reflected in, in, in the many idioms that were used, including Dakani to write those verse, uh, verses like above Saraswati in the uh, wonderful painting I've, I've shown before, um, or anything else that Ibrahim wrote. He wrote everything that we know that he has written was in Dakani. But we do know that we have quite a lot of Persian um, supported that and the images go back to Chalukya and in particular Vijayanagara traditions. So let us think again or compare it just briefly with the Mughal court. Akbar used Indic elements to justify his rule. We all, I've mentioned before, the Darshan ceremony, the Cornish, many of these issues appeared in his um, political language. But there is a major difference here. Akbar incorporated it all into the imperial language that has been dominantly Persianate. There is hierarchy in the Mughal court. Even if things are absorbed, they are being Persianized in order to make them work. In Bijapur, the Indic elements uh, were introduced more forcefully and continued to exist by the side of the Islamic and Persianate tropes with no clear hierarchy. It is not clear what is the language of the state. All those languages existed at the same time. The difference goes another step forward. The language of imperial authority uh, is about power and authority manifested in various ways, military, spiritual, and ethical. This is how we know it from the Mughal court. The same 
um, these came together to create a systematic image of unrivaled imperial superiority that the Mughals needed it so uh, badly. It was part of their existence as empire is exactly developing this kind of language. Bijapur's language is very different. It does not emphasize power. It's, and, and this is part of the reason why there is so little about Ibrahim in, a, let's say, colonial historiography. There is not much military and political issues to talk about. So he's not important in that sense. And his image, the image that he created for himself is much more intellectual and musical and spiritual that has to attract the support of the listeners. He is, in that sense, emotional much more than military and powerful. This des description suggests a possible direction to understand Ibrahim's project. It's carefully constructed into his court in both Persianate and Dakani issues, but heavily relying on what he found on the ground for centuries of develop development. This allowed Ibrahim to work his legitimacy in all those realms and to attract all those groups that were in his court. For local people, part of it was the idea of resurrecting this whole imperialism or let's say local imperialism of the Western Deccan, either directly by appealing to the Western Chalukya like his grandfather Ibrahim I, but more so by taking it by the way of Vijayanagara. So resurrecting much of Vijayanagara's political uh, language in his court in Bijapur. To, to finish, I want to raise two last questions that might, um, much emerge here. I don't have much time, uh, much time to fully develop them, but we can have it if, uh, in the discussion later. First of all, how successful was he in this attempt? And this is a very problematic question. As long as he was alive until his death in 1627, things worked more or less okay. So Narathpur was indeed sacked and destroyed by Malik Ambar at one, uh, at one point. But there is no real challenges on his authority. We don't see large scale rebellions in his reign and even his expansion to the south into Karnat the southern Karnataka from Bankapur and below was not it was very slow and very limited, but did not encounter huge um, opposition. But he failed to attract elements who did carry this vernacular identity for centuries. And these were not that important before 1636. This date is important because this is when Ahmad Nagar stops to exist the Mughal Shah Jahan annihilated the dynasty there and forced some humiliating conditions, even though short term on Bijapur and Golconda. And this leads us to the second question. If he thought that vernacular might be more attractive, or if we know from other places like Golconda, that it would be more attractive, why not going there? And this touches one of the biggest problems that we have in the history of the uh, 17th century Deccan, is how to understand the Marathas in it. The Marathas emerged from within the system of Ahmad Nagar. And reading Bakars or their sources, it reflects um, um, a very interesting, um, let's say, sympathy towards the Nizam Shah. The Nizam Shah is, very, is presented very, very positively in Maratha sources from the late, um, late 17th and into the 18th, early 18th century, so those Bakars. Um, for example, Sabhasad writes quite positively about them, also the, the Sanskrit um, Shiva Bharata. But they hated Bijapur, and it's the, the language, the hostility towards Bijapur is, is striking. And here is the game that we are having. We have Ahmad Nagar being able to create this kind of vernacular identity that the Marathas like and appreciate. We have Golconda very successfully attracting the Telugu Nayakas and absorbing them very firmly into the state to the level that 
until the late 17th century, Telangana was very, very powerful, or the Qutub Shai Sultanate. Bijapur was exactly in this no man's land in between languages. Who would they attract themselves? They couldn't have the symbols or the territorial identity to claim now we are the Maratha kings or the Marathi kings that the Marathas would appreciate. They also were very far away from the centers of Canada scholarship and they were other local dynasties who, who were much more uh, immersed in this Canada world. They didn't have much of a choice. That's my assumption here, is that in order to survive, the only way to attract to any local actor was to say, we are the continuation of this Western Deccani, not specific, not vernacular identity, but the general Western Deccan. And that's why he had to go back to the Chalukyas and more so to Vijayanagara. Um, and in that sense, even though it is not often very intimately directly to Kannada heritage, the way that we see the Qutub Shais with Telugu or the Nizam Shais with Marathi, still Bijapur and Ibrahim himself are very intimately linked to the history of, of Northern Karnataka and even more to the South. And we should examine it the way that we look at other successor states of Vijayanagara in a sense. I think that I'll stop here. I, I talked for 90 minutes, more or less. Almost two minutes remaining. You can speak otherwise. We go with the uh, q and &A. Yeah. So shall we, how shall we go around questions? Yeah. I, I ask I ask recite questions to you. Okay, thank uh, you. First question from Vikar Ahmed. He is working with Frontline, the leading uh, uh, monthly of uh, India. Mm -hmm. uh, he's working in Bangalore. The first question is the main source of internal social and political tension during the Bahamani and the Deccan Sultanate era seems primarily between the Deccanis and the foreigners. Is there no reference to Hindu-Muslim tension in contemporary Persian sources? If there is no reference, how do you see the how do you see Hindu-Muslim relations among the elite as well as the general population? Uh, thank you, Vikar, for this really, really excellent question. I think it's a very important question. Um, the Persian sources. Um, I'm, I'm still working on it. We don't have many references to Hindus at all. We have something very confusing here. On the one hand, they are using quite often, at least the Persian sources, they use quite often this kind of, let's say very negative language against um, Hindus as um, polytheists. So it's this kind of, a language that we know from North India. But at the same time, we don't have evidence of attacks on non-Muslims. Um, we don't have almost any reference to large-scale rebellions among, uh, among Hindu elites within the Sultanate. So for example, if we look for a second at the um, um, Golconda, so the neighbors, um, once the let's say, basic contract between the Qutub Shais and the Nayakas were signed, we see the Nayakas are taking part in political life as, let's say, rulers of forts or within the central administration, and we see no rebellions, almost at all. So from the, let's say, 1530s, 40s, even when Vijayanagara was around and maybe trying to tempt Hindus here to cooperate, they failed. The big exception that we have is, of course, the Marathas, but this is a much later period, and I read this story as not religious issue at all, but actually a political opposition to Bijapur's aspirations that the Marathas said do not represent them whatsoever. They were very happy to cooperate with the, um, the, Nizam, uh, the Nizam Shah of Ahmad Nagar, who, on their part, of course, gave 
major space for the Marathas to express their own needs and sentiments freely. So they were not oppressed on that side. And in that sense, we have this competition between Persian narratives that are sometimes hostile and actual reality that we have almost no evidence to this kind of hostility. It's quite impressive to see how little hostility we have. So I think that even today we have this kind of public image that the relationship between Hindus and Muslims in the Deccan are much more peaceful than uh, the North. Hyderabad definitely has this kind of aura. And I think that it is not only an image, but it has very long roots of much greater cooperation and accommodation between Muslim rulers and um, Hindu subjects. And in the cases when we had Hindu rulers and Muslim subjects, we also see this kind of um, much better cooperation. Um, about the masses, unfortunately, we do not know. We just don't have sources to, to describe that. So I, I don't have a good answer that, um, in that. But yeah, I think that generally speaking, we are talking about more peaceful Muslim-Hindu relationship than elsewhere throughout the period, from the Bahani times and definitely under the Sultanates. Yeah. I hope it answers the question. Pradeep? Okay, I guess that I can uh, continue. Um, a question from Ramesh, how does one begin to think about the problem of success or failure in thinking about a historical sovereign figure? Uh, is continuing resonance of such a political cultural imagination a uh, one way? One, uh, yeah. I think that it's again, it, it's a very, very thought provoking kind of question. What is a success and a failure? Um, yeah, how to measure that? I, I'm not sure that I have a very, very good answer to, to this question. Um, one thing is that to what degree do we see people follow him or rebelling against him? And this is a, a very political question of successful ruler in that time is a ruler that was able to gain as much as cooperation and fulfill the goals of survival, promotion, accumulation of knowledge um, and disseminating of culture with the least possible conflict and coercion. I would say something along these lines. So, yeah, I, I, I think that uh, in that sense, we can look at Ibrahim as a very successful ruler. Um, exactly because during his lifetime, he didn't have much resistance. And to that, yeah, the legacy, the question of legacy is important. But here we are getting into the very mucky territory between history and memory. And the fact that rulers are remembered in one way does not necessarily mean that this reflects their career. So this is always um, a trap. Yeah. Uh, Sir, are you back uh, with us? Yeah, Professor Ramesh is teaching in uh, IIT Mumbai. He's teaching oh. social sciences there. Oh, lovely. Uh, he, he, he has uh, extensive work on Mata system of Karnataka. Mm. And of course, uh, he has a slot in, uh, in, in, in forthcoming lecture. So, uh, there is a question by Ibrahim Saudagar, uh, mm -hmm. that he's from Bijapur. Ibrahim Adil Shah II himself referred in his copper coins as Abla Bali, or friend of the... Yes, yes. Kindly uh, throw light on it. Okay, um, that's a, a really... Thank you. First of all, I'm really excited to have... A, a professor from Bijapur is, is, is really terrific. Couldn't be better for me. Um, it, it's a great one. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I want to retrieve it. Uh, if you just give me a second, because I, I have this... Um, uh, 
where did I put it? I, I have where it is taken from because a blabbling is not only uh, just this uh, little phrase, it's come from a whole song from the Kitab and Nauras. Um, I know where I have it. So if you just give me one second, that's the advantage of doing it from home that I have my laptop just here. Um, So I can open the, where I have the translation. No, I, I cannot find it. So from the memory, I'll, I'll say that this is one of, uh, uh, the coin has a very Persian and very a Shia inscription on one side, and on the other side we have a Blabali, which is one of the songs of the Kitab and Aras. Uh, it appears there. Um, oh, I have to find the translation. It's it's a beautiful, beautiful song that I've translated alongside my uh, friend and colleague um, Richard David Williams at SOAS. So. And it's exactly, I, I, I find it as exactly um, this kind of what Ibrahim is trying to represent here. That on one hand, he's um, the Shiite ruler, the Persianate ruler who resonates within this broader Safavid world. Um, and on the other uh, side, and really literally in the most crude metaphor that we can do, we can say here, the other side of the coin, he's associating himself into this Dakani world that takes him to um, a Hindu gods, basically. We, we have read about Shiva in one of his songs. We have, read, we, we have heard about Saraswati and, and Ganapati in his songs. So um, I, I think that it is a very clear reference uh, or deliberate reference to this song, um, to, to the, the Kitab and Auras with all the heritage, the whole baggage that comes with it, deliberate choice to be on the coin. And this is part of his image. He's uh, the defenders of the poor. Um, sorry, I just, I failed to find this translation with me, so apologies for that. But this is, this we'll have to do here. Um, but anyways, yeah, it is a reference of a... It's very annoying that I don't have it with me. Oh, yeah, I found the, the, the verse in particular. It is in song number one. And he says, among other things, three worlds repeat thy name um, at thy feet. Oh, wonder, oh, great hero. Friend of the weak, this is Ablabali. Through, uh, um, though alone, art the true incarnation. So using the word, and, and the Dakani word here for incarnation is of course, avatar, to use that in, on a coin, on an official coin, the, the other side is a Shia talisman of sort, is quite a thing, I think, and that really represents uh, him. Uh, there is an interesting article by Muhammad Ismail from 1922 that describes this coin and uh, difficult a bit to find. I found it somehow. It was the Journal of the Asiatic Society of Bengal uh, from 1922. Yeah. Professor Ashwat Narayana from Bangalore University is the chairman of history department. Mm. Uh, in the medieval Indian context, how do we understand the meaning of local culture? That's another huge, huge question. Thank you for that. And thank you for joining us. It's a, in, in, in coming to, to this conversation. And I have to write down those questions because I will have to deal with them at one point. Um, the, Local by itself is a very problematic thing. I'm 
used actually quite a lot the work of geographers in the book to define it. I, I looked at um, particular the, the concept of space as, manif as, as defined by the British geographer Doreen Massey. Of course, she worked on modern issues, but the, the idea of how people understand their environment and what kind of content they give to it. And this kind of framework, intellectual framework or theoret theoretical framework really helped me in trying to understand how we have these different spatial perceptions working together. And the idea of the locality here is not something set. It's how different people, where they looked at as part of their own, how they define their circles of what they are dealing with, um, or, or, or what is the cultural heritage that they feel at home in. And in that sense, the term local is very, very confusing because the local of the Deccanis will be very different from the locals of, let's say, Kanadiga Brahmins. Uh, who may have served as uh, tax collectors or as Karnam, say, history writers uh, in village communities under the same rulers. That being said, um, when I'm talking about local, I'm talking about something that is practiced in the Deccan by different groups. And in that sense, it is very much associated to Indic culture. And I deliberately used the name Indic and not Hindu because I, I, I want to take it much broader here than any kind of particular rituals, a set of rituals. Um, but at the same time, so, so it's, think for example, about the, what I've read about Bhairava. Um, there is a very interesting article by Richard David Williams, the one that uh, we, we work together on, on these few verses. Um, he claims that this is actually a vernacularization of an all Indian trope. So we know Bhairava, we know many of these kind of um, tropes that um, accompany Shiva, but where is the moon? Is it on the forehead or is it on the eyebrow, for example? We have these variations which are practiced locally in different ways. And in that sense, the local I'm trying to understand is, or, or the way that I try to understand it, is the way that different groups practiced and what they felt like they are at home. I hope that it makes sense, that it answers this very very big question. I mean, it's uh, as historians is one of those huge questions that we need um, to address, I guess. Uh, second question from Vikar, Vikar Ahmed. From my past readings of the medieval Deccan, I understand that the nobility of the Bahamani Sultanate was divided into two categories, Deccani, which means remnants of Tughlaq nobility plus local Muslims plus Habshis, plus mm -hmm. local Hindu elites and yeah. foreigners, yeah. Uh, elites and second categories, foreigners. In your presentation, you have broken the Deccani category into two parts and removed the Hafshis and the Hindu elite. Thus, you divide the elite into three parts. Do you want to comment on this? No, actually, um, I, by and large, I, or I, okay. No, it's a good question. It's a, it's a question of definitions. Um, I talked at the Deccanis and the foreigners, of course, so those two groups that you have mentioned. Uh, the Deccanis I include in that sense, in particular, in the setting that we were talking about, also the Habshis, the converts, all those who saw the Deccan as their home. And that's why it's a much more general category that you, uh, you have suggested or that you um, have um, um, indicated, I assume that the Habshis, for example, are part of it. The Hindu, I, I chose to discuss the Hindu elites, which are the most diverse of all those groups, of course, because when we say Hindu elites, I include the Marathas and the Telugu Nayakas 
and the Kanadiga Brahmins and the Marathi, Marathi speaking Brahmins who were all over the Deccan and also in North India. So we have a much bigger flux here. I wanted to discuss them separately. And I discussed them separately in that sense as being absorbed to the system and then being there and being such an important part of the military and uh, administrative systems as part of the need of the rulers to start addressing those issues and using this political language. So I say that if, for example, if we are back to Ibrahim, if Ibrahim's elites were only the Khanis, Muslim the Khanis, and actually the Persian sources, when they say the Khanian, or the Khanis, they refer to the Muslims, Muslim. They kind of don't really talk a lot about Hindus. And it's, there is a sense that it's mostly Muslims. Um, so if Ibrahim had only the Khanis and foreigners in his elites that he has to negotiate between them, it would have been much easier for him and he could have ignored Vijayanagara completely and totally. But the fact that all of them started talking to the locality, starting giving patronage to poetry in Telugu, or bringing pillars and inscriptions from um, Kalyani, not in a way to show defeat, because Kalyani has fallen 500, 400 years before, um, Ibrahim the first brought the things, but in order to to mark that we are actually the continuation of them, it means that Hindus were very important. So I, I didn't do a very good, good job, I guess, uh, if it wasn't clear that I, I treat them as separate groups, but they were all present within those elites. So we have the foreigners, we have the Dekani Muslims, and that's what I mean when I call the Kani, and those include the Habshis. The Habshis or the Ethiopian military slaves, I treat them as part of the Dekanis because basically those are part of the group to which we say that um, they are Dekani because they didn't have anywhere to go. And the foreigners remain foreigners because they saw themselves as foreigners and they continue migrating and circulating all over the place. And we have the Hindus as a very broad category. Again, not very accurate. I hope that this answers the, the, this question. Uh, professor uh, V. N. Lakshmi Narayan, uh, English professor from Mysore. Uh, uh, would you provide uh, a backdrop of, of the material details of, of details of the crops, labor, living standards of the people, both Muslims and Hindus, uh, as the creators of wealth also for which these rulers and invaders fought with each other, especially in the time of Ibrahim Adil Shah? Uh, I'm not, um, I, I, I actually don't have an answer for that. We don't really know much. There is a little bit the works of Hiroshi Fukuzawa, who tried to look at the peasantry in Maharashtra in the 17th century, including the northern parts of Bijapur, during the period of Ibrahim. Um, I personally didn't really look at those issues. So I, I looked mostly at political language, political structure, so I looked at the elites. It would make at the same time, fascinating project and extremely difficult because we don't have much sources for it unless we start going into bhakti literature, I suspect. So Sufi literature I might deal with, but I, I don't think that I will be able to start reading. I don't speak or read Kannada, unfortunately, so I won't be able to, to see how it was approached. That's the only source I can think of for uh, the condition of the people. This and a few European uh, reports, Portuguese and later maybe also Dutch. Um, but again, they weren't, how reliable are they? So I, unfortunately, I won't be able to answer this really interesting question. Apologies for that. Uh, yeah, okay, we have finished our most questions. Um, it's nearly uh, two hour 
uh, you know a long session beautiful session thank uh, you by roy official um, it's really you know raised a lot of questions also rather simply you know getting answers and discourses and i think uh, uh, in the in the context of karnataka history uh, you know we need to locate more and more uh, the the uh, the idea of bijapur and ibrahim adil shah and you know we need to invoke more and more discourse on it i think um, um, it's a wonderful enlightening session and uh, i heartily express my thanks on behalf of uh, uh, bengaluru itihas uh, bengaluru historian society uh, and i express uh, thanks uh, on behalf of uh, dr s k aruni and uh, i am from itihas darpana the editor in chief uh, angu rajesh and uh, Uh, another forum that is rutumana dot com. Uh, Nitesh Kuntadi is representing, and I also thank on behalf of uh, the great audience, nearly seventy one people who attended or you know hit in this uh, particular forum, and a lot of people have seen simultaneously in uh, uh, in in Facebook. Uh, on behalf of them also, I uh, express my sincere thanks and. Uh, Uh, thanks for accepting uh, a great uh, you know uh, lecture uh, for bangalore historian society thank you roy fisher and thank you very much pradeep and for a, a bangalore historian society for inviting me and for the audience and for this absolutely wonderful questions that i i i really need to hear this kind of questions more and i i hope it will be a beginning of more of a conversations with Uh, uh, scholars, historians, um, and, and literary scholars in particular in Karnataka. I think that this is the only way forward uh, to, uh, to, to understand Bijapur in Karnataka. So yeah, thank th you very much, Pradeep. Thank you, uh, Rai, again. And uh, we, you know, uh, welcome and you know, looking forward to you. Uh, to be uh, present physically in bangalore and in bijapur or across somewhere in karnataka oh, and you know we are direct you orally from you and you know engage in a greater discourse on bahmanis and especially ibrahim adil shah uh, once again i uh, express my sincere thanks and i'll uh, you know forward all the questions to you through email oh and, please uh, do please again do. again my uh, uh, personal and uh, you know collective uh, thanks uh, for you uh, roy yes special for a wonderful uh, session uh, thank you very much and of course if anyone wants to continue this conversation you are most welcome to email me sure yeah uh, uh, if anybody wanted to you know continue the discourse then they, they can able to write to bangalore stone society the mail is provided in the poster and they can call also uh, they can have a roy official uh, number and uh, especially and his email e his email and uh, continue the debate and uh, we are uh, very happy and again uh, we are thanking roy official and thanking everybody thank you very much thank you very much